Hello and welcome to the Overlanding Podcast, a podcast dedicated to vehicle-dependent travel. I'm your host, Andy Smith. Throughout the series, I'll be chatting with adventurous people who have chosen to travel the world by bicycle, motorcycle, car and truck. The aim of the podcast is to discover what motivates people to embark on life-changing journeys and to hear some incredible stories along the way. John and Suzanne described themselves as two 50-somethings who wanted to experience adventure before dementia. Not having done anything like this before, they naively jumped in at the deep end and purchased a Volkswagen Synchro T3, named it Tigger and promptly hit the road under the name Tigger's Travels. Let's find out more. Hello. Hi. 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 Joining me around the virtual campfire today is John and Suzanne, uh, who travel under the guise of Tigger's Travels. Um, if you'd just like to introduce yourself very briefly, please, and just explain to our listeners um, where you've been. Okay, so I'm Suzanne. And I'm John. Um, we are collectively Tigger's Travels. Uh, we left the UK back in uh, April 15, drove across Europe, Central Asia, through China, uh, down into um, uh, Mongolia, China. Sorry, something's just happened on the computer. It wants to restart. It wants to restart. So it just, wants to restart. <laughs> oh. yeah. um, so we might lose you. Okay. No, it's gone. It's gone. Okay, sorry. Do you want to start again? Yeah, we'll start again. Cause it, sorry, sorry, sorry. Just it's, it's just that <coughs> freaked me out. We're right at the beginning, so we may as well. Um, hello. Hi, guys. Hi. 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 Joining me around the virtual campfire today is John and Suzanne, who collectively are known as Tigger's Travels. Um, welcome around the campfire, guys. Hi. Um, if you could just let our listeners know just a little bit about yourselves and where you've been. Okay, I'm Suzanne. Um, again, I'm John. And uh, yeah, we left the UK back in April 2015. Uh, uh, drove across Europe in our VW camper van, mm. Tigger, uh, through Europe, through Central Asia, down into China, Southeast Asia, and then we shipped across to the, the North America to Vancouver. Uh, we've been up to Alaska and we're currently in St. Louis. Great. That's a pretty amazing journey so far. <laughs> um, I think I first came across you guys when we were also on the road and our paths have actually nearly crossed a few times. I think once in Istanbul, um, just uh, I think a week after we left, uh, my Greek friend in Istanbul sent me a photograph of your car. <laughs> And was like, look what I've just seen. And I was like, ah, I recognise those guys. I've seen them on the uh, on Facebook. And then I think just recently, uh, our paths very nearly crossed in Southeast Asia and Malaysia because I think we used the same shipping agent. Yeah, uh, one dollar. Yeah, a guy by the name of One Dollar, who typically you wouldn't normally trust if you met him on the street with a name <laughs> like that, would you? No. <laughs> it, it, it took me like ages to be able to call him one dollar it felt really weird <laughs> yeah well the, when i asked him why he was called one dollar he said i'm 50 cents better than 50 cents and i was like <laughs> <laughs> okay. he's a nice guy yeah he's a really yeah, he's nice guy good. and obviously very good at what he does because we've got our vehicle back here in england now and you've obviously got your vehicle over in the states yeah, yeah, no, he was great, and uh, we, I don't know if we did this with you, but we went out for dinner with him a couple of times. Mind you, everybody eats in Malaysia, don't they? It's just like, that's all you do in Malaysia is you, you go out and eat. But, um, yeah, he, he, he was just, he was so nice, and he, he he's a traveller himself, isn't he? So he does a lot of overlanding himself. Yeah. So uh, that was that was quite nice, because he really understood where we were coming from, as opposed to just being a shipping agent. He's yeah. also given us some good information for our onward journeys as well, places to avoid, places to go, and how the system works. So, yeah, he's very helpful. Yeah, he was a really good. And and, and to be honest, he's a, a, a bit of an uh, anomaly in the shipping world because shipping agents are typically a bit of a nightmare to work with. Um, yeah. So that was really cool. Um, anyway, you guys have been on the road for a little while now. Um, 19 months now. 19 months. How, how are yeah. you finding it? Are you f 
Is it still as fun as the day you left? Or, and how do you think you've changed in that time? <clears throat> um, first of all, I think, it, yes, every day is fun because, it's, as you know, every day is different. It brings new new challenges, new uh, adventures, new experiences. So it's always exciting. Have we changed? Uh, I think Bob, probably. I mean, I think the 19 months I've has had its ups and downs because otherwise it, it wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be overlanding, would it? I suppose we've gone from I've gone from being way way too hot in Malaysia to way way too cold in <laughs> in, in Alaska, um, and uh, yeah, living in the van more absolutely twenty four seven while we've been in North America because it's like too expensive to go to hotels or whatever. Uh, yeah, it can be challenging at times, especially when it's really cold. I think um, we're, well, we're planning to go home for Christmas because I haven't been home since we left. So we're going to go home, have a proper Christmas with the family. And I think the answer to the question, have we changed, will probably become more apparent for me when I get home. Yeah. Uh, and how, how things are in the world that we left behind. Yeah. And just to go back to the very beginning, the the world you did actually leave behind, and and before you set off on this, had, you, had is this your first major overlanding trip? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. it is. I mean, basically, we had this um, <clears throat> epiphany <clears throat> when we were our kids. We've got three kids, and uh, we decided that they were all big enough and ugly enough to look after themselves now, and uh, that if we didn't get on and uh, do something with our lives it'd be it you know adventure before dementia i think is what i heard somewhere and uh so we just yeah had this right okay we're gonna we're gonna do a an adventure and um originally we thought we might do the trans-siberian express um and uh so I looked into it and they thought ah, oh, well you know you can't actually get off the train and go very far on you and you're always going to be stuck to where the train is blah 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 so we thought okay so maybe we could drive somewhere and you know that internet's a scary thing isn't it so you get on there and I can vividly remember being online and going oh my god people drive around the world <laughs> and that was it that was it that was that was what we were going to do in fact the website I looked at was the guy you had on uh, a little while ago Paul Oh, and yes. I, yeah, so it was his website that actually inspired us. And uh, I got in touch with his, uh, with Helen, actually. And she was great, and she gave me lots of information. Yeah, of course you can do it. And uh, that's a good thing to say, actually, is that the Overland community, are, you know, we're a helpful bunch, I think, actually, and, and pretty friendly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and that's just really what happened. So then we thought, right, John knew what car we wanted. So that was his bag. Well, actually, at that point, we were thinking that we'd go uh, as a couple. And we, like you, we've got a surf at home. Yeah. Um, so we were thinking of using that. And I imported it from Japan a, a while back because I thought I wanted a 4 before car. But I can't afford to buy one from here. So I had a look around and found that they were quite cheap in Japan to import from. So we got this thing and we were going to... I thought, oh, maybe we'll drive it to Japan. And then we talked about it to our youngest son. He said, oh, maybe, could I come with you? And we thought, mm, okay, we need a bigger vehicle. <laughs> so then I started to research that and found that within our budget, you know, there wasn't very much. And the, uh, the Synchro, which is our his Tigger, was probably the, the correct platform for us. It's capable and just about big enough. Yeah. And it, it's interesting, actually, Suzanne just mentioned that the overlanding community is quite tight. And one thing I've really noticed... Um, talking to a lot of people um, recently I've been talking to a lot of bikers and um, and this is the point I have to remember that I haven't uploaded all the podcasts yet so our audience don't know this um, but recently I've been talking to a lot of bikers and one thing that the, is really apparent within the biker community is, is how tight it is and, and something I think that's interesting about your particular choice of vehicle is that the Volkswagen Synchro T3 in particular, and, and generally Volkswagens in particular, have a really tight community of their own. So you, in some regards, you're, you guys are part of two communities. You're part of the overlanding community, but you're also part of a, a, a kind of Volkswagen community. Um, oh, for sure. Did, did you realise before you left that there was like 
a huge kind of Volkswagen scene? Are, are you both petrol heads, or you know? No, not really. No, not really. Um, I think everybody knows that there is a community of VW lunatics, um, particularly with Beetles and things like that. But we weren't part of it. Although a long time ago, we used to have a, a bay window. Yeah. Which did a little bit of uh, touring in Europe in when our family was only then two children. Um, yeah, no, we, I don't think we had any idea that it was as huge as it is, and no. especially the the whole T three synchro thing. Um, although we we probably got an inkling of that before we left, because obviously we 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 actually got the van from Barcelona uh, because it, they're actually not that easy to get in the UK. Uh, especially within our budget so John flew over to Barcelona and then drove it back and then we had to because that's a left hand drive isn't it yeah so the vehicle's left hand drive which has been a a, a fantastic advantage everywhere we've been there because just about everywhere apart from Southeast Asia is uh, is the wrong way around for us coming yeah. from the UK yeah. and also place I was quite keen to have a left hand drive because I think when you go through Central America that can be a bit of an issue if you've got a right hand drive car places like Costa Rica, I think. Um, so we were quite keen to have the left-hand drive as well. But um, anyway, getting back to the VW community thing, it's been phenomenal. <laughs> uh, it's actually, as you say, we are really part of two communities. And, uh, yeah, I mean, everywhere we go. And, and people just stop us all the time, not just because Tigger is decorated the way it is but because they're like oh wow well, man you've got a synchro you've got this and yeah <laughs> it's all the time <laughs> yeah and I, I think well especially in the US I don't know if you've you've noticed that um, the interest would be kind of greater in the US but I think certainly in the last well in the last five years I've really noticed uh, an increase in the interest in overlanding in particular but also in the US, I think a lot of young people now are, are starting, you know, they're really interested in this kind of small house movement and, and van life and, and finding kind of alternative ways of living. And I think certainly since there's a, a guy, I don't know if you're aware of him, I'm sure you probably are, called Foster Huntington, who started um, the van life website, which is essentially just photographs of people of people's vehicles who live in their, their vans. And I think that certainly helped to start a community in the US, which in turn means that people can, yeah, and, and with the proliferation of the, the internet as well, young people now can work from wherever as long as they've got an internet connection. So I, th I think there's a, a certainly a resurgence in kind of people who live in their vehicles, which is certainly oh. something as overland as we can relate to. Absolutely. I mean, we've really noticed that, especially because we've been spent quite a bit of time on the West Coast. And this whole van life thing is absolutely huge here. And uh, we've not really been into Instagram that much, but we met a couple and we said, oh, no, you've got to go on Instagram. Uh, so we have been. And people come up to us and go, oh, hi, guys, we've seen you. On, we've seen you on Instagram. They just come and see us because we wanted to come and say hi. And we've, we've got a little bit of fame on the West Coast <laughs> by just because uh, they love the van. They think it's like so cool. But yeah, absolutely. Van life is absolutely huge. Here. You, and exactly what you said, people, they, they live and work out of their vans. Um, they're sort of digital nomads, whatever. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's very, very big here. Yeah, and one thing you just mentioned there is um, you're talking about that people had seen the van, and obviously for anyone who's listening who hasn't seen um, your website, Tigger is painted up like Tigger the Tiger, so it's kind of orange with black stripes, um, and it, and your vehicle is really quite iconic. Do you think that in some way has kind of benefited your trip? I guess it, it's, oh, it's, definitely, yeah. it's kind of like a... Really you should be interviewing the van, not us. <laughs> <laughs> We're the ones that are just leading it around. It's, uh, it's the van that gets all the interest. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the whole point behind, I think, the, the decoration of the van was we uh, wanted... It came beige-coloured, and it was really bland and boring. And at the end of the, the process of renovating it and, um, and kitting it out for, for an overland vehicle, uh, trip, we had a little bit of money left over, and I said, we we've got to do something the way it looks. And, and I wanted somehow to camouflage it, although when you look at it, you'd think that would never hide anywhere. <laughs> yeah. 
so we painted it orange and then went to see a, a local um, uh, vinyl wrapper in Cambridge and he, uh, he designed the uh, the stripes and the and all the logo and stuff on it for us. Actually, the logo was done by a, a friend's son who works for uh, a company, so I shouldn't, shouldn't mention him. And he did that for us. Yeah. So that was the end of the budget, the last splurge. But it's been, it's actually been a real great icebreaker because, uh, you know, when we said we were going to go off on this journey, um, and I'm sure like many overlanders, when they say they're going to go to the stands, everybody goes, oh, gosh, you're so scary. Gonna... I think well, somebody once said to me, you can take a gun. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but um, anyway, so we thought uh, our the idea behind having the van as it is was that, well, look, we're going to stick out anyway, so we might as well, like, be fun and uh, have people. And, you know, just they love it. Absolutely everybody do. Uh through Central Asia and well everywhere. I mean, they just love the van. They love to. It, it's it, it brings a smile to people's faces, which is which is really nice. We do. We get waves and smiles, and people go past us, and they're, they're hanging out the window with their uh, smartphone, taking photos <laughs> of us and waving to us and honking to us. It's great. Yeah, I think it's nice that you can kind of stick out in style. I guess. Um, yeah. it's, it's not so much the style it's, it's just to be it's to be welcomed and, and to to be welcomed with a smile instead of a suspicious look yeah I don't know we've that, probably got some suspicious yeah, looks do, yeah. as well <laughs> I think it's um, I think it's really quite important because uh, I was chatting with uh, a lady called Fiona recently and she she had done a, a long drive to Southeast Asia as well but in a really old school um, Volkswagen Baja Bug, so they're kind of off-road Volkswagens um, in a Beetle, Volkswagen Beetle, um, and her car obviously stands out a mile compared to everyone else in Land Rovers, and I think it gives it a kind of unique angle, um, which then in turn can draw more interest, and especially with things like social media now, I think having a slightly unique angle or having a unique vehicle can be really important and help boost your social media and having something that's instantly identifiable is like having a, a kind of well-known brand. Um, oh, absolutely, yeah. I think that is totally it. I mean, as I said, this whole Instagram thing has, has really taken off. We're really surprised. I mean, we met these guys and they said, just post a picture every day. And it's it's quite, I, well, I find it amusing. It's like, I like taking pictures, obviously, with some amazing scenery here and one thing and another so you post a picture of this like amazing scene and it gets you know, a few likes post a picture of the van just yeah. anywhere and it, the likes go mad <laughs> you know well, that's nice but you know the van's good you just any any old picture of the van and people love it absolutely love it uh, but i think that's sort of partly the vw thing partly the van life thing as well but uh yeah, I feel as though we're the uh, the unknown spouse of a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, um, and uh, just to go right back to the very beginning again, and and just to talk about your trip, you were you mentioned that this you'd never done anything like this before. So so when you initially left in the camper. Um, how did you deal with things like wild camping and has your kind of confidence grown now with that the the kind of more you've done it yeah definitely i mean we literally didn't even we were on a pretty tight time schedule because like many others we'd uh, booked our guide for china so we had to be in a certain place at a certain time and literally the van had, was finishing its renovations on the saturday and we left on the sunday so we didn't really even use it before before we left um and we were we were good little campers good little overlanders going through europe we mostly stayed in campsites and things and then when we got to turkey we thought all right we can wild camp now and uh yeah it was it, it was a bit scary the first few times it was i remember the first time we we had no option to find a campsite we were in albania and uh, driving around, we thought, oh, go down this little dirt track here, and that dirt track it led us into a, an agricultural small community, and people were looking at us, I can't imagine why, and uh, we thought, where are we going to stop? And uh, we did eventually find somewhere, but we were very nervous about that, being off-road off, off road 
and away from the, the correct camping environment. So that was our very first wild camping experience. But, and we were nervous, weren't we? Yeah, definitely. But now, in fact, that would be my preferred camping, oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't really... I mean, we do occasionally, if we desperately need a shower or something, we'll uh, we'll go to a campsite. But... <laughs> we'll keep ourselves away from others. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but actually, the yes, that's, our confidence has grown enormously in that area. And uh, yeah, wild camping, boondocking, stealth camping, whatever you like to call it, is uh, is definitely our, uh, our preferred. It's it's be. strange that now we're here in America, well, uh, North America, because we went to Canada first. The most worried I think we've ever been for our personal safety has been here and it's not because of the people it's because of the wildlife yeah you know up, up until we got to to Canada it's like everyone says watch out for those bears don't yeah. leave any food outside yeah and that's true we've, we've woken up and seen bear tracks around the van yeah, yeah. And uh, that's that's interesting and and was that something that you had considered before you left and did that help well, I, you were talking about that your son was going to come with you and that kind of um, informed your decision to, to buy the camper, but was that something you had considered before you left? Did you think, oh, we should try and get a vehicle that we can sleep inside for security reasons? Or No, not really, um, although now we've got it, we do, yeah. um, because we were thinking of going in the surf like you and probably would have ended yeah. up with a roof tent. But um, no, I think a lot of these things, as far as... We organised, once we had the vehicle, we organised it. Suzanne organised the route and all the visas and all of that. We never gave any thought to personal safety, um, where we might be going in terms of that. It, we just thought, oh, we'll get there and it'll work itself out, which is exactly what it has done. Yeah, that, that attitude is, is something that's been a common thread through everyone that I've spoken to, really, is, is this kind of relaxed attitude that, you know, everything will work out one way or another and, and typ it does, yeah. typically it does yeah um, I, think, I think with the VW thing as well which we did think might be helpful <clears throat> at the beginning was that we thought it might be easier to get past didn't you oh uh, yeah that was another thing to, to know that the vehicle we had should be relatively easy to source parts on the road in some places it, it, it so really is in other places it's you, there isn't any there's none at all yeah it's, like it's, in the stands yeah, as, as far as that criteria goes, that's obviously something that's very important when you consider buying a vehicle, but from kind of experience, the, there isn't one vehicle which is entirely global. There are some, obviously, like the the T3, which are better than others, and Toyotas as, as well generally have seemingly good um, spare parts availability globally, but there isn't one particular vehicle which is kind of good for every country which is really unfortunate and also the the vehicle you've chosen um, that particular kind of size of vehicle um, that has four-wheel drive is is there are hardly any in the market um, you know you don't really have many options there's there's the t3 Volkswagen t3 and then there's the Mitsubishi um, Delica or the L300 I think it is um, other than that, there really aren't too many vehicles of that kind of size which have four-wheel drive that you can actually sleep inside. Um, and that's kind of, I don't know, it, it, it doesn't leave you with many options, really. Um, but I think no, you, no, it didn't. That's what I was, when I was looking into it, this is all I could find that, that fitted all the criteria. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, we didn't actually choose it for any particular reason that other than it fitted our needs at the time and I didn't think far enough ahead about it. I'm not really a petrol head or a mechanic. It just, it, it, it was there and it fitted and it worked and I thought, well, there's no point in looking any further. We can't afford the big Unimogs and and we don't want to go in our car. So what's left? Yeah. And, uh, there wasn't, Jos. And then just then, John, you mentioned that you're, you're not a huge petrol head and, and not Maybe not. He is a bit. He is a bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, He's I, playing that down. Yeah. Right, my, really. my wife says that about me as well. Actually, she says, "Oh, you are massively. You're just playing it down." And I'm like, "Well, actually, no. I'm not really a mechanic." But but had did did you have any kind of anticipation about that before you left? Was that a worry before you left, or did you just kind of go for it? Um, Half and half, really. When we when we got the vehicle and we, we slotted ourselves into the community and found 
there was a guy called Simon Whitmore who lives relatively near to us in uh, East Anglia, uh, and he helped us out with a, a lot of the, the mods and the fabrications. And um, I was I I wanted to spend a day or two with him taking things apart and putting them back together again. But as we said, we were we were still doing the the renovation work the day before we left, so that never actually happened. I was always conscious of the fact that I was probably a bit underprepared. But I watched a few YouTube videos. Camper van culture, are really good, um, run by a guy called Jed Walsh, and uh, he posts lots of uh, uh, tutorials on on how to do various things on the vehicle, which is great. And he does some really nice uh, travel video videography. He's just done a, a trip up to um, the Arctic Circle in Norway. So yeah, that's how I, I've managed to get by with uh, essential maintenance. Yeah. Learn it on the road as you go. Yeah, and it, and it, I think again, the choosing the vehicle you've chosen um, certainly helps because the the online support you have is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and it was one of the reasons why we chose the vehicle we did also because the, in the UK there's a, a forum called the Hilux Surf Forum and on there those guys are just massive petrol heads and you can literally ask them any question about a Hilux Surf and they will generally get back to you in about half an hour with an answer. <laughs> um, I don't know if you're like me but sometimes does the answer outweigh your knowledge to understand it? <laughs> it does for me. Yeah, occasionally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually quite often. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but just but sometimes just gathering that information. For example, we had a problem with the ECU, which we didn't know was a problem with the ECU. But I, I basically went on the forum and said, "This is the the symptoms. This is what's happening to the car." And someone came back to me about ten minutes later and was like, "Yeah, your ECU is fried, and then you need to do this, do this, do this." Once I'd gathered that information, I could then go find someone who could resolve the problem. Um, so those kind of like communities again i guess it's all about communities isn't it and uh, yeah. and and it's just incredible now that we have the you know, the, the technology at our fingertips and we can be in the middle of nowhere and still get that information um, i mean john's joined loads of uh, like forums and whatever and um <laughs> on facebook he's got like well, uh, my our kids think it's absolutely hilarious. John's got 1,700 friends on Facebook, <laughs> most of which are VW people because he just makes friends with everybody that's got a VW. If they've, so, got, if they've got a VW picture in their profile, they're my friends. <laughs> yeah, and of course these things snowball, don't they? But our, our kids think it's just highly amusing that their father's got all these friends on Facebook. So, uh, But the VW community has helped us out like big time um for instance we uh we met and we had a problem in turkey i don't know what it was only to cool the problem wasn't it anyway yeah, blah blah blah, blah. Okay. Uh, uh you had this problem in turkey so we got in touch with the uh some synchro guys there and they basically organized us across the country from one end of the country to the other they got us a garage set up they met us they took us to the garage you know organized it all and then we went, you know, this was a guy in Istanbul talking to a guy in, I don't know where it was now, somewhere on the Black Sea anyway. And uh, then when we got to... Um, Samsung. Oh, yeah, Samsung. And uh, interesting story, actually. We were in Turkey, and uh, we before we left, we had these, like, T-shirts made up with Tigger's Travels on the back, and it's got a picture of the van. And uh, we actually we were on a balloon flight, and John was wearing his... Uh, his Tigger's Travels t-shirt and this girl said uh, when we finished the, over Cappadocia when we finished the flight she got out and she said is that a synchro on your back is that, you know, and we said oh yeah yeah she said, and anyway chat 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 she said uh, she said she was from Thailand she said oh my dad my dad's the um, synchro chairman of you know the chairman of the synchro club in Thailand so we said, oh, wow, we're going to Thailand um, and we very well need to get some work done. So long story short, she put us in touch with with him. And then when we got to Thailand, we met the whole VW uh, Synchro community. Uh, well, not just Synchro, we met the whole VW community. Ended up going to a VW uh, festival in Bangkok. And uh, as I say, the whole VW community looked after us in Thailand. And then when we got to this VW festival in Bangkok, we met some guys from Malaysia. 
we weren't even going to go to Malaysia. We were going to ship out of Bangkok. And they said, no, 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 guys, you've got to come and see us. We, you know, we, they were real VW mad. Uh, and they've all got two, what, two? Well, they've got a collection of Beatles and, and um, Splitties and Bays. Yeah. Anyway, so you, you've got to come to Malaysia because we, so, okay, we'll come to Malaysia. So we went to Malaysia and we actually ended up staying with this guy for three months. He just put us up in his house and they, we, we, we actually did it, obviously did a tour around Malaysia as well in the van. But, uh, and they organised, everywhere we went, they organised for people to meet us, to take us out to dinner, to, I mean, it's just phenomenal. <laughs> very, very social people in Malaysia, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. 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 Wonderful. And the food is pretty good as well, right? Oh, oh yes. God, the food. The food's amazing. That's the best, best. I love curry. It's my favourite food. And that's... Yeah. And, and He only said the other day, oh, I wish we were back in Malaysia. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sick of burgers. But yeah, but the beauty is you can find Malaysian restaurants everywhere, which is if you, if you hunt them down, you'll find a good Malaysian restaurant somewhere. Yeah, that's you, true. Um, <laughs> and, and that kind of... Um, you know, being so welcoming like that, would, did that kind of take you by surprise? Because obviously we've travelled a very similar route to you guys and had very similar experiences. And and when when did you first notice that maybe the rest of the world is slightly different to the Western world? Was, was that something that became apparent to you quite quickly? Or did, did that kind of hit you when you kind of hit Turkey and realised you were leaving Europe? Yeah. I think Turkey is That's probably the turning say, point yeah. as you go from Europe to Asia. It just kind of happens and it becomes, um, you notice the religious differences, the, the, the mosques, the minarets. And, and then when you leave there and you, then you go into Georgia, it's like back into Europe again, but with a twist. Yeah. And then it's all, all over the place. You go into Azerbaijan and it's different again. And, and but the friendliness did, did you cross the Caspian? Yeah, did you go across the Caspian Sea? No, we, we came uh, through Turkey, Georgia, Armenia, back through Georgia, and then we went up the Georgian military highway, f- transited through Russia into Kazakhstan, then all the way across okay. Kazakhstan. Oh, you went over the top. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. then, and then we headed south again, all through Central Asia into Iran, and then down that yeah. way. Yeah, I think we crossed. I think we were just behind you in Kyrgyzstan because yeah. you went up. You went up uh, Songkol just before us because I remember looking at your pictures. But um, yeah, so no, I think the people, the change, the friendliness, probably just. I'm not saying that people weren't friendly in Europe, but we didn't really probably pay much attention to it. But things changed as we got into Turkey, and I think from there on, yeah, it was just. Yeah, and it's not, and the stands were just such a, I mean, I was nervous before we left. I mean, we've done a lot of travel. We've always travelled quite a lot, um, but I've never been, we've never been to Central Asia, and I was so excited about going there, and it didn't, uh, it didn't disappoint in any way. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. Well, that, that was going to be my next question, actually. I was, I was thinking about kind of preconceptions that, like, just then you said you were a little bit nervous, and before entering and as you as you kind of travel for every country your kind of confidence grows to some degree but every time you get to a border there is always kind of slight trepidation of the unknown oh absolutely and, i mean yeah. e- even now even now even coming from into the states from canada it was like okay so it's another new i mean we've been to america many times but it was just yeah it does when you approach a border your heart sinks and you think oh how long? How much are we going to have to take out? <laughs> are they going to rip us off? But we haven't had really any problems. We've had a couple of times where we've had to pass money. Yeah. Uh, the most annoying one, actually, was when we went from Cambodia back into Laos to go to the 4,000 islands. And um, previous to that, we'd had to pay $50, $50 to get out of um, Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan into Uzbekistan because we were very late. We were about half an hour before the border closed. And, and he, he noticed that that was the last day of our visa, so we had to go. Yeah. So that was an opportunity for him. Other than that, now when we were in Laos, they wanted a dollar here, another dollar, and then another dollar. Actually, we only ended up paying about five dollars. But, but it, it was, was so just, annoying. It was just the annoying, and it was just like, well, what's that for? And it, it was just like, well, if you don't pay, just turn around and go back. So yeah. <laughs> I sort of think, okay. I did fine. say to the guys, I said, look, I've just given him one, I've given him two. 
I said, where's this money? Is that going in his pocket over there? And he said something to his colleague in, uh, in his language. And I said, what did he say? He said, uh, he said, if you don't want to come, then you can go back. <laughs> we said, OK, here's the dollars. <laughs> yeah, I, it's funny you say that, actually. We had a very similar experience in the exact same country. And, and typically, um, we're quite relaxed at borders and just kind of go with the flow. But that particular border was hard work. And um, it, it got to the point where I had to kind of usher Emma out of the border control building <laughs> because <laughs> that I could see that the the fella in charge was getting more and more infuriated with us, uh, <laughs> yeah. which isn't a good place to be, really. Um, yeah. But it, it's, it, sorry, it's well, funny, it's, you were just saying the, the kind of trepidation. When I asked that question, I was kind of thinking more along the lines of the trepidation of entering the country and things being different and unsure about the country. But it's it's funny because there are, you know, there, it's a double-layered thing, isn't there? There's the trepidation of the border first, and then there's the, the kind of worry of what the country is going to be like. Yeah, um, absolutely. And the funny, one of the, actually one of the most, and not, wait, wasn't it, it was one of the most countries where they took literally everything out of the van, and I don't know whether you had this as well, and they x-rayed the van, was Uzbekistan. But this wasn't coming into the country, this was leaving it. <laughs> it was yeah. just like, well, I'm going now. I mean, well, what do you want? Have you got pornography on your phone? Well, actually, our son was with us at that time. <laughs> he said, uh, "He said, have you got any pornography on your phone?" He said, "No, no." <laughs> and and he, I think he was thinking, "Well, I hope nobody else has either." But uh, you know, it was just—it was just like they took everything out of that van. And you think, well, what are why? You for? Well, what are you looking for? Yeah. <laughs> Anyway. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> yeah, we had similar experiences in Uzbekistan. They were they uh, take you. Well, I don't know if you had the same, but they took all our phones and, and yeah. basically yeah. showed me the folder with the photos in, and we literally went through every folder. Um, it was yeah. really, really invasive. Um, and then they were asking us if we had any religious books as well and things like that. And I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's a bit of an uptight country as far as security goes. I think. Yeah, I was cross because I had to get. I had some codeine, and I had. Uh, I even had a prescription for it. I mean, we just took it because just in case sort of thing. But the guide in Turkmenistan made me throw it away. Yeah, it's really annoying. Yeah, <laughs> uh, there are lots of medicines that are banned all through kind of Central Asia, um, and, and and yeah, typical medicines that you would normally carry too. And you have to be really careful because there's the prisons. It's actually a prison sentence if you get caught with them. Yeah, it was a bit dodgy because we were at the, he said, it was actually as we arrived in um, Turkmenistan, he met us off the boat and he said to me, have you got any, have you got any code, uh, what drugs have you got? And I said, well, I've got some code. He said, you're going to have to go and get rid of it. And I'm like, well, where? <laughs> because how am I going to get rid of this? I was like, I had a big packet of it. You've got and to take said, it well, all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I so I thought, oh, maybe I'll just go drop it in the sea. So, oh, I, but there were all these guards there, and I thought, well, I can't just go and drop it. They're going to sit and watch me. So I thought, okay, I'll go to the loo. But there was no loo on the side of, you know, us. we had to wait till we went through. So in the end, I had to really feign that I don't, you know, I had a really bad stomachache, and I desperately needed to go to the toilet. And then I, thought, I thought she had, actually. She could fool me. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to get rid of these blooming codings, which was, uh, which was that's so That's an uncommon... A common thing on on the road, is it? Suddenly yeah. you struck the tummy ache. <laughs> yeah, and, and <laughs> not to lower the tone too much, but how how have you kind of dealt with that? Um, have there been times when you've been just ridiculously ill, or have you managed to kind of avoid it? It, does, it doesn't you take long to get round. Yeah, it doesn't take long to get round to <laughs> toilet humour, does it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't remember where it first happened, but yeah, you get. You get mild tummy upsets where oh, she's going to kill me for saying this now. But <laughs> it becomes humorous. And you think, oh, how far did that go? <laughs> That's dreadful. Projectile poo. Yeah. Come back yeah. and tell me, tell me how far it gone. And I was like, really, this is too much information. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it it can be uh, it can be challenging and tedious as well. I think my I think my record for one night I think was about fifteen times, and I was just like, and that was in and out of the roof tent as well. Yeah, that's not good. That's not good. Although, 
so we're, we're actually staying with friends at the moment and uh, uh, obviously in a house which is rather nice and uh, when I got here I said I'm, I'm going to have to resist the urge to go out and pee in the garden in the middle of the night <laughs> because this is like unreal to have a toilet next door I have to retrain <laughs> yeah so the, 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 again going back to the point that this is the kind of first big trip you've gone on what, what do your kids and your family back home think about you doing this they're pretty, uh, they're pretty laid back about it. I don't think they even follow us on social media or anything. It's just like, oh, maybe, maybe they do a little bit. Maybe a little bit. But um, as our younger son, James, he did actually come with us. He flew into Turkey and spent six weeks with us until uh, Kyrgyzstan. So he experienced a little bit of life on the road. Mm. And uh, have you spoken to him about that experience? Because I think when you travel like this, you kind of get eased into it like just before we were saying your confidence kind of grows with um wild camping and and you know just traveling in general your your confidence grows and things that are probably quite unusual then become seemingly normal and you kind of acclimatize to it how how was he when he kind of literally flew in and was and was dropped into this scenario you know for example did you go wild camping with him and when he yeah. Needed, oh, yeah 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 and when he needed the toilet was he like where am i supposed to go to the toilet yeah he was actually really really ill <laughs> in the <laughs> van <laughs> he was so ill we were in uzbekistan it was like 45 degrees we've got no air conditioning and he's in the back of the van with a bucket i felt so sorry for him um but anyway uh yeah i think i was once told and i do agree with this that there's uh, there's three stages of travel there's the planning there's the doing and there's the reflecting and i think for him the reflection is better than was, the ref- was better than the actual doing. I mean, he did enjoy it, and it was a great experience for him. But I think six weeks in a in a van with your parents when you're 18 is probably enough. It was enough. Yeah. Um, and which is fine. But he does talk about it now and say, "Oh, it was cool," and this, that, and the other. So he, I think he he did enjoy it. But uh, I think he is 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 quite tough. So I, he didn't mind the the roughing it a bit. But. Um, yeah, it was actually three of us in the van was a bit of a push. I mean, you hear of people with whole families, like two kids, you know, travelling overland in a VW. And that must be really tough because it was, I always felt as I was standing outside the van waiting to get There was always somebody standing outside waiting to get in because it was like you'd, you, all Take three turns. of you yeah. couldn't really be in there at the same time. So, uh, yeah. It's challenging. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. That must have been quite interesting for him to kind of return then, like, because he he came with you all through Central Asia as well, right? Yeah, so he came, we picked picked him up in uh, Ankara, he flew into Ankara and then he flew back out of uh, Bishkek, so he was with us. But he actually felt, I mean, Kyrgyzstan was actually one of our most favourite countries and he really felt as though he'd finished on a high because he really loved he went he came up to some coal with us and and all that sort of stuff so yeah, yeah he really loved Kyrgyzstan and I think he 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 said he felt as they'd finished on a high yeah uh, well it's so certain, he, it's, it's certainly um an amazing country it's a I've, I've just been this week I've just been writing a blog actually and I've been trying to narrow down my top five countries for overlanding in that we that we've been to and uh kyrgyzstan is certainly in the top five it's a pretty amazing country yeah I mean, it, it's still i still one of my favorites and i think it was uh probably i don't know it's not quite as stiff as uzbekistan and as, i mean i loved uzbekistan it was great but um it, i always felt as though it was a little bit i don't know Maybe it's the political situation there. Everything was a little bit. They struggled, didn't they, when they broke away from Russia? They didn't do. They didn't have the same relationship as other countries did, where they had dictators. Mm. Yeah. They, they tried to make their own way. But Kyrgyzstan democratically, I think, felt felt much uh, freer, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think one one of the reasons why it feels more relaxed and freer like that is because they, they've they actually taken note to some degree that the importance of tourism like yeah. it, there's mm. there's not a massive in- infrastructure there for tourism but 
they've kind of acknowledged the importance of it and and I think that has changed the whole attitude of the the country to some degree and and I think one of the other reasons why it's really great for overland is is it's traditionally a nomadic country so they're yeah. used to seeing people pull up and park and and because you know nowadays they transfer all their stuff around by a truck so they're used to yeah. seeing people arrive with their worldly belongings and then set <laughs> yeah. up camp and then leave again and I, I think I think that has a, a big effect on the people also yeah, and they're so friendly. I mean, the most friendly people as well. So welcoming, and you know, it's, it's so typical of, of that sort of saying where you know they've got nothing, but they'll give you everything. And I very much felt felt that in in Kyrgyzstan. You know, you always be invited in for tea and whatever. We did a a, a four day horse trekking uh, expedition whilst we were there, and uh, the people who ran it, we we had a little time. Yeah, and talking to them one evening, and the, and the lady was telling us how how life for them was very difficult because at that particular time, sort of at the end of the 80s, when they were breaking away from Russia, um, she had young children, the same as we had two young children at the time, and life was incredibly difficult for them. So for leaving the Soviet Union, they had no support anymore. Uh, nobody was giving them minimum money to survive if they hadn't got a job. It was sink or swim. Her husband had to travel uh, to the capital to work, and he was there for like a couple of years, and then he came home a couple of times, and he would send boxes of food home on a bus to his young family. And this was quite weird for us, because she was describing something at the same time we had young children, and, you know, it was, it was a, a world apart, Could basically. we imagine that happening for us? It would have been so hard. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we met um, a family in Kyrgyzstan, um, and they they were invited us to have a picnic with them, and we because they saw us camping, we we went over and sat with them and had food. And the young woman spoke um, kind of kind of broken English, but enough that we could have a conversation. Um, and she had literally just had a child, and she was basically like in a couple of weeks' time was leaving the the child with grandmother and flying off to Moscow to work. Um, yeah. And and she was like, yeah, I'll be gone for a year, and and she's literally just had a child, um, which we we were just blown away at that. Um, those kind you of you do get this immense feeling of privilege as you travel, don't you? Think yeah. here we are traveling. I know we're on the road, and it's it's tough from the perspective of what we've left behind, but we're traveling around extremely privileged compared to the people in the countries that we see. Yeah, I feel very guilty sometimes about that. Yeah, it can it can be really difficult, and it's actually it's something that's popped up in the last couple of podcasts is is kind of cultural the importance of cultural exchanges, um, but also being a kind of ethical traveller where you you know you you just have to spend your money wisely and make sure it gets to the people who need it, make sure that you're not taking you know more than you're giving, and and because. You know, tourism is very new in a lot of these countries, and and so people are still finding their feet. And what's beautiful about a lot of these countries is the fact that tourism is new. So when you go there, you don't get the the hard sell, or yeah. you know, like like for example, uh, Morocco can be incredibly pushy if you go to um, the yeah. capital, and and that's because the tourism is is kind of so rife there, and it it can really sully your experiences of the the country. But all through Central Asia, because tourism is so new, that you, they don't have that. And that attitude is incredibly refreshing when you visit them. And you, you yeah. meet real people who aren't interested in just taking your money. And that's what's important, are those cultural exchanges, rather than them just trying to make money out of you. Absolutely, um, I couldn't agree more. Um, we also did some volunteering in Laos, which we had no idea we were going to do before we left. But anyway, we ended up... I was working in the hospital and John was working in the, uh, uh, he was helping with some construction of a water pipe in a village. And um, that was such an eye opener. I just, as you say, and they these people were so grateful that we were helping as well. We, you know, they just couldn't be more thankful that we'd, they'd, you know, we'd given up our time to help them and it was so rewarding I'd certainly recommend anybody to do mm -hmm. a bit of volunteering if they could 
and yeah, two months we were there doing that, so we were we were nicely integrated into the community. It was it was excellent. Yeah, I th- I think again that's important, and that's you know that's the kind of thing I'm talking about with the, the kind of cultural exchanges, um, like when we travel, we t- we take part in um there's a website called Work Away. Which That's is, where uh, we got it from. Yeah, which is yeah. a work exchange program, and we, I think we've done seven or eight in various countries, and some, and, and and they're really great for overlanders because, you know, you're not earning any money, but you're certainly not spending any money, and at the mm-hmm. same time, you can ask all those questions about the country, you can learn about the country, and and sometimes it's nice just to stay in one place, um, mm-hmm. because the the momentum of traveling can be quite tiring sometimes. Um, so it is nice to take a break and stay in one place. Um, yeah, you do regret moving too quickly sometimes. You think, oh, I wish I could go back and spend a little bit more time there. Why are we rushed away? Yeah, and and that's that's kind of quite interesting. The things you're talking about there, um, traveling through Central Asia and talking about how the you know these kind of satellite countries broke off from Russia. Is, is traveling in this way kind of renewed an interest in history and politics that you had? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely history. I mean, we were, uh, <laughs> well, we listened to a lot of audio books, actually, when we're driving as well. And we've listened to quite a few historical ones, but we've listened to the whole, what was that book called? Uh, Genghis Khan. Yeah, about Genghis Khan, which was really enriched our trip to Mongolia. And, and through China as well, because they were there as well. But yeah, so yeah, it's definitely uh, revived our. Interest. It becomes relevant, doesn't it, yeah, to, to learn relevant. history whilst you're in the geographical location. Yeah, I, th- I think it's it's kind of really important, I'd, and it it gives you a greater appreciation of where you are, also, because it, yeah. it, it gives things context, doesn't it? Yeah, but more of a perspective about the people and the country and an, an understanding, basically, that's what it does. It helps give you an understanding. Yeah. We, we've all heard of, like, Cambodia and Vietnam through various... Well, this is how I get my information on the world, through films. <laughs> <laughs> and and to visit the countries and to meet the people and to see the museums and and to, I wouldn't say learn the truth, but to, to get a, a realistic view of things rather than a one-sided Western view of things. Mm. That was enlightening. Yeah, I, like I find it fascinating. That's certainly one thing for me that uh, has, I, and it was completely unexpected when I left. I'd like it hadn't really occurred to me how much of an impact that kind of stuff was going to have on my life. But mm. certainly, as we've travelled, my interest in a kind of history and politics has been massively amplified. Um, just because you you kind of meet the people on the ground and you kind of. Um, you know, you you want to share their experience of how they've got to where they are. Um, yeah. You know, you you might be just passing through the country in a, a month or two months or whatever, but you know these people spend every day there, um, and they don't have that that kind of privilege to be able to travel. Um, yes, it's no longer a recollection from a, a documentary or a book. You're meeting the people in the flesh. Yeah. Seeing, you you see the history unfolded in front of you, and it, it's uh, it's very humbling. Yeah, I think everybody has this experience when they go there. Yeah, and I think that the word you you just nailed it there with kind of humbling. It it, it is. It kind of gives you a whole new perspective on your own life, which is I don't know. It's one of the reasons why we travel, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, how was your time in Mongolia? What time of year were you in Mongolia? August. In so August. we were there. We went there for middle of August to the middle of September. September. Yeah. So that was, yeah. Oh, it's definitely a highlight of the whole trip. Yeah. From a from a driving and vehicular perspective, it was the highlight. Yeah. yeah. It that... was. Uh, it probably was one of these things that I've mentioned earlier that it was probably better to look back on yeah. <laughs> than it was at the actual time. Um, no, it was. It was actually out of everywhere. It was probably. It was a real adventure. That's what it was. It was very exciting. You talked earlier about. Um, preparation and I don't think you can really prepare for Mongolia um, uh, I talked earlier about this guy that, that helped us and he said well I was discussing whether or not we should have a winch on the vehicle and he said well really you shouldn't be going anywhere on your own where well, you're going to need a winch should you I thought well that's probably one way of looking at it 
And then what do we do? We drive off into Mongolia on our own, <laughs> without a winch. Not that we needed a winch, but... Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a real adventure, that's what Mongolia was. Yeah, and, it, and <laughs> not, not to go away from talking about Mongolia, because I, I certainly want to come back to that, but the, the winch argument is one that's kind of rife with amongst 4x4 four four overlanders, and it's, it's pretty funny when you hear for kind of people discussing it T- typically it, even if you'd got stuck in mongolia in mud or whatever you know and you had a winch there probably wouldn't have been a tree that you could have tied it to <laughs> <laughs> we, we did get stuck in mud in mongolia but we didn't need the winch to get out we used our waffle boards uh, and, okay. uh, luckily yeah we, we got out of one hole and kept going so that was all right yeah but, but we're yeah. talking about winching there was a um an episode on Top Gear where they interviewed the guy Richie, who uh, he he likes to go green laning, and and they they laughed at him for having a winch. He said, "Yeah, you get a winch and then you go and get yourself stuck so you can use it." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and well, and typically as overlanders, you do your best not to get stuck because oh, yeah. that kind of added dimension can be incredibly stressful. And it's it's funny yeah. though, Suzanne, you're talking about. Um, uh, you know how, on reflection, it was amazing, but at the time, it may have been kind of difficult. I think everyone has those kind of experiences, and uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I heard a guy give a talk, and he was talking about that there are, there are three different kinds of fun. He said, "There's um, fun one, which is fun in the moment. When, so when you're actually doing something, it's fun." Yeah. And he said, "There's type two fun, which is when you look back on it." it's actually fun at the time it may be kind of terrible but at the time you look back it's it's fun then he said there's type three fun which is not fun at the time and not fun when you look back (laughs) (laughs) and i I think as overlanders i think if you kind of tread a fine line between type one fun and type two fun you're generally going to have a good time but if you spend too much time having type three fun then it's going to be a bit of a nightmare yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think the well, anybody that's gone across Mongolia will know the it's it's a challenge for sure. Yeah. And uh, sometimes those roads, you just think, well, it's a good day if you get out of second gear, and <laughs> uh, and uh, you know that's just. A, I mean, we came in from the um, from the west, from the top of Kyrgyzstan, no, Kazakhstan and drove the middle route across because we didn't want to take the southern route thought, oh, that's, everybody goes southern it's a bit easy, we won't do that one and we, the northern route we thought was a, probably a bit too muddy for us so we went the, the middle route which is probably, I think I don't know, I don't know many people that have done the middle route they either do the northern route or the southern route and uh, I don't know where I was going with this but anyway, it was, an, it was a total adventure that was... Uh, yeah, yeah. Some days it was just like, well, if we've done fifty kilometres, we've every, done really well. <laughs> every now and again, it's, well, not every now and again, just very, very rarely, you might come across a new road being built, not very long, and you think, God, look at that piece of black tarmac. So you head over to it, and it's all the excavation work is still on the side, like big piles of earth, so you can't really get on it. But you'll find a gap, and you think, oh, there's nobody looking. Let's let's use it. So you go speeding down it. You're probably doing sixty or seventy kilometres an hour now. It's like unprecedented. Wow. And then all of a sudden, the road stops at a river where they haven't built the bridge yet. And you <laughs> think, get off the road. I'm to glad get I in wasn't river. driving that at night time because that would have been disastrous. Yeah, yeah. That that was going to be my next question actually because we drove through there in 2012, I think it was, and the Chinese were certainly investing a lot of money and started building roads um, and I know that they had developed quite a, a lot since you know 2009 2008 they'd been quite busy and I was just curious if they had actually continued to complete that because I know there's a lot of resentment from the Mongolians um, towards yeah. the Chinese for you know coming in and trying to steal their resources yeah there was a, well there's a really good road I think from Russia to Lumbata we didn't never went on that but uh, and then of course from Ulaanbaatar Batar to to the Chinese border there's the roads fine I mean it's a bit bumpy but it's it's tarmac um, but other than that we just came across very few bits of road mm. there was one from the uh, sand dunes and from the bottom of the Gobi back the up Gobi to Ulaanbaatar up to Batar as well, yeah. and there's one bit of new road that we found 
sort of randomly in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it's like, why is this bit of road here? <laughs> why? It doesn't start anywhere. It doesn't or start anywhere. anywhere. It's just, like, it's just like it's a bit of tarmac that's just been like dropped out of the sky. It just didn't seem anyway. Yeah. But, yeah. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that because it was my kind of concern that within a couple of years it would it would be you know, you'd be able to drive across the entire country, but it sounds like the road hasn't kind of ventured across into the west, which is the interesting bit to drive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, to be honest, so, as I say, we took the middle route, so it might be different in the southern route. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, no, it was... Uh, we didn't come across much tarmac at all. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's about an hour, but I think I do have a few more questions, I think. Um, Happy to go on. Yeah, if if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a, there's a couple of things I just wanted to cover, probably very quickly. Um, in previous podcasts, um, we've kind of discussed about kind of how I don't know, and and generally most of the people I've spoken to. Um, it's been on reflection because a lot of the people I've spoken to have kind of completed overland trips. I've only spoken to a few people who are actually still in the middle of them. So what I want to kind of focus on is is kind of the future of where you're going now and, and kind of how you're approaching your trip. So kind of did you, did you have a set plan when you left off? Were you like, we're going to go traveling for two years, this is where we're going to be when? And, and how flexible has that been? Um, well, I think what we decided was that we wanted to go round the world. That was basically what our plan was and still is. Um, so uh, we sort of planned it in stages. So it was from the bit we've already done down to Southeast Asia. Uh, and then this is sort of phase two, as in North America. Um, and we've probably travelled much we didn't have a time limit but for some reason in our head I think we thought oh this is like going to take us a couple of years well well way out and um, so, so we're now at a point where we're 19 months in and maybe about halfway I don't know probably about halfway round and the budget's more than half gone and the budget's <laughs> the budget's not doing quite so well um, and and uh, yeah, so we're, we're actually going to be going home for Christmas and probably not going to be coming back till about April because we've got a few things we need to do. I think we're probably a little bit different to other overlanders. As we, we do like to do a few other things whilst we're doing it. It's not about we must stay in the van, we must not do anything else. We like to, to have a few experiences on the way if we can, which I think has hurt our budget a lot. Yeah, I mean, like doing the horse riding and things yeah. like that. <laughs> so that that's probably, but uh, probably earlier days we were, you know, you think the budget will last longer than it does. Doesn't. Anyway, <laughs> um, so yeah, we're about halfway, and we're going to go home because we need to do a few little things at home for about six months. Well, not six months, but four months, and uh, then we'll pick up again, and hopefully back to the US, finish off the US, down to South America, and back up to Africa. But the time limit, we will, as I say, we will way out with that. I mean, it's gonna, and I think we're more realistic with things now. We've been on the road. Obviously, you've got more experience. You, you've got a better idea how things work. So, a, I think we'll travel slower when we come back, uh, more frugally when yeah, we definitely. come back. You've that lesson. And um, yeah, yeah, slower and, and uh, yeah, it's. Take the, it's um, like a lot of the people I've spoken to, there people have kind of like different styles of overlanding, and like a lot of the motorbikers, for example, like the challenge of being able to ride from point A to B, and it's more about riding the bike than seeing the country. Yeah. That's, that's that's not everyone, but kind of th these are kind of conclusions that I've kind of gathered through talking to so many people. Um, and the same with cyclists. Cyclists, they kind of have a challenge. They like to be able to, you know, get from A to B, and that's their challenge, and that's a goal. Whereas I think generally people who travel by four by four, um, they have 
a we have it so easy compared to them. I'm yeah, so ex to them. exactly. We have a, a kind of a, the next level up of luxury, which yeah. Yeah. I, I think kind of allows us because I think we have slightly different intentions because I, I think we're more interested in the kind of travel again. I'm, I'm stereotyping massively here and I'm sure I'll probably get some complaints but I, th I think if, if you travel by 4x4 four four, you, you're kind of more interested in those kind of experiences and seeing the country as it, opposed yeah. to being a physical personal challenge of going from A to B Absolutely um, and, and I find that quite interesting and one, one thing I did notice um, were occasionally we'd meet um, people who were also on the road and they would pop us a message and say oh we're going to be here, we're going to be there uh, do you want to meet up and we'd be like yeah cool totally and we're like where are you now and they're like two countries behind us and they're like we're going to be there next week and we're like what? Oh, <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Okay so and, and, and then you realise that some people travel at a ridiculous rate and yeah. and you just and, and to me that just seems insane because you're driving the same distance so ultimately it's costing you you know a, a similar amount of money to, to just travel slower and if you if you're self-reliant and you can sleep in the car then you know food yeah, exactly. food is incredibly cheap in a lot of these countries so you can kind of if you've got the luxury of time you know you may as well take it and slow down and and that's something that i'm really thankful to hear you just say that you know you just said that you know you want to take it kind of slower and I think that's really important. Yeah, we... I would have to go on and say that's probably where I was going with my comment about we're not like other overlanders. I think we made a mistake by thinking it was... Uh, we probably had had to get from A to B and we probably didn't take our budget seriously. You know? Where we kind of Most people talk about having planned their, their journey for a couple of years and we just kind of got it into our heads, we must go now, otherwise we might change our mind and not go. So we rushed off. And, um, and we weren't quite as prepared as we thought we were. I think the van was. I think the other thing is as well is that we had a few uh, places where we had to be. Oh, yeah. So, for instance, like we had to get to the Mongolia-China border because we were going to join that uh, you know, group yeah. to cross. So that was limiting that makes because you've got to be somewhere and we've had it a couple of times here as well when we went up to alaska we were desperate to go up to get the arctic circle picture and um so but we had time uh, but, but the weather was our enemy so we we had to rush to get to the arctic circle otherwise it was just going to be we, we weren't going to be able to get up there because it was going to be too cold as it was it was really snowy and and whatever and, and unfortunately we had a an engine blow up in the meantime as well but um so we we've given ourselves these and now we're at our friend's house and we had to be here for a particular time and and we've given ourselves these deadlines and i actually don't like doing that i'm going to stop doing that i've decided in future <laughs> is that i'm not going to have deadlines and because they make you rush and uh, although it's obviously lovely to be at our friends etc etc and <laughs> but it, it, it these deadlines are yeah, they put pressure on you, and I don't like it. Yeah, and and just then you mentioned that you had a, a engine blow up, um, and obviously you 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 have you know there are things that are set in stone, like you know you have to meet a group to cross a border or or whatever. There, there are things that are set in stone, but there are so many unknowns involved in what we do um, that can be incredibly stressful. And like then you mentioned that you had an engine blow up. Have, have have there been times when you've actually thought to yourself, you know, why am I actually doing this? And and have there been any times when you've you've kind of thought about jacking it all in and going back? No, no, I don't think we've. I I actually did go home because uh, to see our kids. I I find that probably quite difficult. I got to. A, I think for me there was once when we were in. Uh, in Thailand and I just thought it was so so hot it was just incredibly hot I couldn't stand the heat but it wasn't so much that I just had a real big bout of homesickness and in the end John just went go home because otherwise we're not going to finish this trip you need to just go home and 
we hadn't sort of put that in our budget either. It was a, an emergency trip <laughs> home. And I just had to go. I had to go and see the family and be with them and see our friends and just touch base. And I went home for two weeks and that was good. And that meant, okay, I can come back. And it was all fine since then. But I just had to go home at that point because I missed everything and everybody so badly. And yeah, at the time, I felt as though I was like... Uh, you know, I was wimping out and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't being a true proper overlander and I was wussy. But, you know, at the end of the day, everybody's different and I needed to see my, my family. And, yeah, that's it. I went home, came home, came back and it's been fine. I'm looking forward to going home at Christmas. Of course, I am again as well. But I'll be equally as much looking forward to coming back. Yeah. It's, it's funny. One thing I've just picked up on one thing you, you said there, you know, you were saying like, oh, I don't want to feel like I'm a real overlander because I've wussed out. <laughs> but yeah. one one thing I've noticed is that there generally isn't really kind of any snobbery to being an overlander, which before we set off, I thought there might be because you sometimes see people in these really expensive trucks or yeah. you see some people who are just like straight up Bear grills who have like a Land Rover Defender that's <laughs> yeah. like prepped like yeah. and, and they're you know in an inch of its life yeah yeah, yeah. Tricked, tricked out as they yeah, say yeah, yeah. yeah. I, i'm an adventurer i'd start my mm -hmm. own fire i do this i do that yeah but but generally we've met kind of all those people as we've been traveling and, and there there doesn't seem to be any kind of snobbery really um uh, where you know people think i'm a better overlander than you are i guess um which is no, quite maybe nice. I was a bit disappointed in myself. Maybe that's all it was. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, a little while ago, we came through Las Vegas, and uh, um, the uh, the Overland community there, they stop off in the RV parks, particularly in Circus Circus, because it's quite well, cheap for Las Vegas, and it's, it's a nice little break. Anyway, so we, we stopped in the RV park, and next to us there was a, a union market uh, with a German couple in it, I oh, had a chat with them, and, and you get round to the question like, "How long have you been on the road?" And you know when when someone pulls the rug out from underneath your feet. Oh yeah, with nineteen months, eleven years. Oh. <laughs> I've been on the road for eleven years, but that did make me feel better that they were also staying in an RV park in Circus Circus. And, yeah, because sometimes they do feel a bit like, "Oh, you know, if we do." If you feel like you've gone back to school and you're talking to the teacher. Yeah. 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 And it it is incredible and. I, d I know exactly how you feel because we've we've met people in similar situations, and it is astounding when, you know, we're, we're babies, really, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> when absolutely. You, when you consider some of the trips these other people are taking. <clears throat> well, we certainly couldn't do that amount of time in our small van, though. No, we 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 have uh, we had we have fantasies about the van getting bigger. I mean, we don't actually <laughs> want to get rid of the VW, but we spend. A lot of conversations talking about. If only the TARDIS were true. <laughs> yeah, if if it was just a little bit bigger. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's it's interesting adapting to those kind of restraints and restrictions, though. And I think that's what makes it kind of fun to because you, you, ultimately you're putting yourself in a, a new scenario. Like like for example, you'd never travelled in this way before, and you could have kind of set off and then one month in gone actually we can't live like this we're getting on each other's nerves the space yeah. is too small i don't like crapping behind a tree <laughs> like, like there's all these kind of factors that and and it is it really is like jumping into the unknown isn't it when you leave yeah and i think yeah. that can be very daunting and i think it's incredibly brave of people to to kind of undertake these trips and that's one of the reasons why i wanted to set up the podcast really was to kind of not necessarily have a podcast where we're sat talking about each other's vehicles and the techie side of it, but I'm I'm really interested in kind of what drives people to take these trips uh, and the kind of reflection and introspection that they go through on the trips and then kind of how they deal with the rest of their lives once they finish the trip. Because I, d I don't know for you guys if you've kind of experienced that, but certainly on our trip, I found it in just life changing. And um, from this point onwards, I know my life is is taking a very different course than if I hadn't gone on this trip. Um, is that something Actually, you feel? 
Yeah, definitely. I'm actually quite, uh, I'm quite apprehensive about uh, how I'm going to feel like going back to normal life. Yeah, it's, definitely. Yeah, it's like, oh, I don't know now. I don't really know how I'm going to slot back in to that normal life world. Because, I mean, when I went home for the couple of weeks, it was like a holiday from a holiday, as everybody kept telling me. Um, and so that was different. But the thought of actually going back and living at home and working and doing all those things that normal people do, I'm not quite sure how that's going to happen. I think um, we're going to have to be careful not to become like ski bores and you only talk about what you do yeah. and become travel bores. But, yeah, I don't know. It's it's going to be it's going to be tricky. I think that, yes, it has changed our whole outlook on, on life and also where we want to go forward. I think that's probably more. It's changed our life. Of work. Do, do we want to go back to the humdrum or do we want to carry on exploring? I mean, there's so many places we, I mean, we've got the, we know where we're going to be going when we come back, but then we're going, right, we really want to go to Iran, we really want to go to Pakistan, we really want to go to Australia, we really want to do, and, and you sort of think, wow, that's that's more trips. Yeah. So, so I don't so know. The, the difficult bit is the, well, funding. So, yeah, certainly <laughs> for us is the funding. Like, now we've kind of got that travel bug. It's um, it's it's difficult to sustain it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's something just to pick up on something John said there, it, it, which is again one of the reasons why I started the podcast. I'm I typically in the past I found people who had gone off traveling, backpacking or whatever, had gone to I don't know backpacking in Thailand for six months, and then they would come home and just I I I never wanted to be that person who would just come yeah. home with stories and cuz there's a certain amount of smugness to telling a travel story I think which yeah, is like is which is like yeah I've done this I've done that I'm better than you and but at the same time like I, we as overlanders experience so much I I I wanted to kind of create a platform where people could tell their stories of what they've been through and and for me the podcast was ideal for that because it meant I got to chat to other overlanders which would kind of keep my interest in overlanding ticking over while I was back in the UK and and kind of saving and getting my life back to normal I guess yeah. um uh, but at the same time it was an outlet to get everyone else's stories out there so it, the kind of inception of the podcast for me worked perfectly and I, I think the the dream for people who kind of undertake overlanding trips is to then be able to monetize what they do so that they can continue doing it yeah um and that's easier said than done I think. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no it's it's really difficult and it's it's something that we grappled with for our, our trip like our, our trip was a bit complicated because we left originally in 2012 and then we had to come back because of family illness and then we left again so it was it was really broken and and must have been dreadful yeah and and so the it it, it's kind of engulfed our life pretty much since about 2010 really so a good a good you know six seven years of our lives have been taken up with this trip and for us we're constantly thinking about how we can kind of sustain it and and it's really really difficult and i'm really looking forward to kind of interviewing people who've <clears throat> and i've spoken to a few already who've written books or people who've made films and how they've gone about that and i think at some point in the future i'm going to do a very specific podcast and interview lots of different people and piece together um people's stories who've actually found a way to sustain traveling um, yeah, that'd be really interesting. Yeah. I mean, just just on that note of your podcast, I mean, we've been on the road and we've listened. I think we've listened to them all uh, that you've broadcast so far, and we find them highly entertaining, really interesting, and obviously, I suppose we're overlanders, but um, yeah, I know. So thank you. <laughs> Basically, yeah. is what I wanted to say. Um, yeah, yeah. we've we've really really enjoyed them, and I love the different perspective of you know like the cyclists god what respect for those people and uh yeah so it's 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 been um yeah it's been really good to listen to and interesting and it's always good to get and i suppose that's the nice thing about talking to other like, overlanders because like john said you don't want to go home and be this travel board but like when you're talking to other overlanders it's like oh yeah it's, and it's this, a and license this, to let and, go isn't and, it? yeah you can 
so that's 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 really good. So yeah, we've really enjoyed the podcast. We listen to hope, uh, hope. people. Hope we're not too boring. <laughs> we listened to Heather's last last time, didn't we? And yeah, Heather her, Ellis. Her story oh, well, was what amazing. a story is that? But. Yeah. And we thought, well, what on earth can we have to say that's of any interest <laughs> after that? But anyway, but uh, no, I, I I don't know. I think everyone, and that's one thing I I became really aware of as we travelled. Like everyone I met had an incredible story like for everyone you'd meet some little guy in a little village in the middle of nowhere and if you could communicate with him um and then get his story out there it's just incredible like and and we met so many people on the road who um are traveling for all different kind of manner of reasons and we, we met a really nice um couple who we traveled with and actually they were in a synchro uh a red synchro called Karossi. And um, she said something that, that kind of was really profound and kind of hit me. She said everyone that they meet who they're travelling, they're doing one of two things. They're either looking for something or running away from something. Mm-hmm. And, and I was like, yeah, that's kind of perfect. Because, you know, I, 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 in the context of my own journey, I was trying to think about you know, what side of the fence do I sit on in that argument? I, I was like, am I looking for something or am I running away from yeah. something? And, and, and to be honest, there, there were, I, th- I think it's 50-50 in my case. Yeah. I think I'm <laughs> half trying to run away from something else and I'm, you know, searching for something. Yeah, uh, I, I think I'd go with that. I think you probably, it is a bit of a split. It's too difficult to say to, say, to fall one side of that fence. Mm. But, but, I think also we've probably fallen into a, a situation where we're taking advantage of our time in life. Our kids are old enough to, to be on their own now and and we wanted to get out and do something before we were too, too unable to do anything. So and, and yeah, certainly, we've got a long time doing it now. <laughs> yeah, and, and certainly chatting to you, it doesn't sound like you have any regrets, right? It's, oh, no, 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 yeah, no, none at all. You made the right decision. So yeah. Talk, so I, I think that's a, a kind of natural place to end the conversation on. And, and what would your advice be to anyone who's remotely got a slight inkling they could possibly do something like this? Oh, just to don't, actually just do it because don't be deterred. Don't. It's not. It's. It seems daunting, but actually, once you get out there, it all falls into place and it's fine. <laughs> and it's easy. <laughs> but it isn't as daunting as you think. Yeah. Perfect. I'm sure these podcasts will help. Well, hopefully, we'll act as an inspiration. Like mm. everyone I speak to has an incredible, in, kind of inspirational story. So, I think it's it's great. Perfect. Thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Like many of our podcast interviewees, John and Suzanne started out on their adventure somewhat naively. Now, after more than a year and a half on the road, they have become well known amongst the overlanding scene. To some degree, their decision to travel in a Volkswagen T3 has unsuspectedly welcomed them not only into the overlanding community, but also into the global Volkswagen community and the burgeoning van life scene. Unconsciously, this decision has really enhanced their experiences as they've travelled and is possibly something people planning a trip like this should consider. I'm completely in awe of people who make such dramatic changes in their lives, and seemingly a lesson learnt is that if you do, most of the time you're not going to regret it. If you like the show, please subscribe on iTunes and write us a review. This helps boost our podcast up the listings. We are also Overland Tribe leaders on the new autofocus social media platform Drive Tribe. Sign up, search Overland in Podcast, and join our tribe for unique content. If you're an overlander yourself and have an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at aroundtheworldin800days at mail.com or you can get in touch with us via our website, theoverlandingpodcast.com. On there, you'll find links to all our social media channels too. Please like, share, bump and give us a thumbs up along the way. As usual, many thanks for joining us around the campfire. That's it for this week. Thanks. Goodbye.